Hello, BookTube. Well, it's the beginning of December, and that's usually the time when your video feeds are filled with videos of people uh, making December TBRs, uh, where they, they list their dreams and their hopes and their aspirations for what they're going to read in the month of December. And usually, on this channel, what I do instead is a TBR BY, a, TB, a to be read by you. Uh, because usually I have read ahead, and, and it, I want to note books that are coming up that I can recommend to you. Uh, and the reason I keep saying usually, <laughs> as those of you who have been watching this channel in the last two months will know, I was dealt a horrible blow by the month of October 2018, which was freakish, even by, by my standards, just freakish. Mountains of books that had to be read in one, in one month, quite a few of which had to be reviewed as well. <laughs> I still haven't recovered from that month, and I am, as a result, way behind. Uh, so I have... Uh, some books to talk about for December, but I uh, some of them I'm just going to be expressing normal TBR interest in them. Uh, some of them I have read, but quite a few of them I have not read yet. So I, I will just be expressing that I am interested in them, that they are, in fact, in the normal tradition of BookTube, on my TBR. Uh, so I thought we'd just go down the list. I've got some physical books here, just so that you're not staring at my smallpox scars the whole time. Uh, so the first one is uh, is a uh, a gigantic work of YA, The Queen of Air and Darkness, by Cassandra Clare, the latest book in the in the uh, the Dark Artifices series. It's a big, thick thing, and I haven't got to it yet. So, I, I recently got uh, in the mail lovely trade paperbacks of of two earlier volumes, and I have reread those. So I am now primed and ready. <laughs> I'm not going to reread everything by Cassandra Clare. I've noticed online lots and lots of her fans taking the imminence of a new hardcover as a, an excuse to just reread everything she's ever written. I'm not going to do that. So I've, but I have done a little rereading, and I, for some reason, am, I appear to be on the list only for the finished copy of the, the new book, so I haven't actually even received it yet. Uh, I'll plow through it as soon as I get it, but it's definitely on my list. Uh, then, uh, In the House of Lies by Ian Rankin, the new Rebus novel. Uh, I have it. I don't know that I have it here. I don't think it's one of my visual aids. No, it's not. Okay, it's not one of my visual aids, but uh, it's a December release, and I love the series. Everybody loves the Rebus novel, so I'm, I'll, be, I'll be getting to that. Uh, then, uh, a big... Uh, one of those big Marvel omnibus volumes. I, I have read quite a few of the individual issues in it, uh, but I really want the whole run in one book. It's the, the Dan Slott Mike Alred run on uh, The Silver Surfer, which comes out this month, I think it's a December release, and uh, it you know in in bookstores it'll be a big ornate thing. It'll be a hundred dollars, uh, and it's it's an odd, very intentionally idiosyncratic take on the the classic Silver Surfer character. I uh, I have acquired finally after many years of not being able to, I've acquired a taste for Mike Alred's art, uh, so, and and I don't think that the storylines in the Dan Slott run are quite as psychologically unhealthy as quite a few of his critics have pointed them out to be. So I'm, I, I, I loved a lot of the issues that I read of that, so I will, I will gladly read the whole collection. Uh, and also, uh, when it comes to, to uh, graphic novel type things, there's an ongoing graphic novel adaptation of Elric, of Elric and Monibene, the fantasy novels about uh, an albino sorcerer king. Uh, by Michael Moorcock. And they are adapted by Jean, Jean-Luc Cano and drawn by Robin Recht. Uh, and I got the first one and really liked it. And the second one comes out in December. So I'll be getting that and going through it. Uh, you know, loving it in its own right. But what I really like is, for, is to have the Elric books in some form other than, I, mean, I have the, the classic old yellow spine daw mass market paperbacks with the pulp pages that are falling apart and the beautiful cover artwork. And I have the whole set of those. I, I think I have doubles and triples of some of those. Uh, but what I'd really like is a, is a big, gorgeous uh, one volume Elric. You could, in, in eight or nine hundred pages of a trade paperback, you could do all of the, the Moorcock Elric novels, all of the traditional ones anyway, the standard canon. And I would love that. Or if not that, then a whole bunch of little trade paperbacks with new design covers, maybe uh, maybe new uh, introductions or whatever. I, it's just another example of what I've mentioned on this channel before, of how science fiction and fantasy tends to consume its own progenitors so that you don't... I, it's as, as a, Considering the incredible wealth of the, of the backlog in science fiction and fantasy, I don't know why that backlog isn't treated with more respect uh, and made available constantly 
to new readers all the time so that they can discover Gormenghast or Silverlock or you know the Amber novels or or for instance Elric of Melnibone how many of them even know who he is uh, one way or another uh, I, I, I would I would love that someday I will I will be making one of these videos and I will mention that there's a beautiful new set of Elric that's coming out but in the meantime I'll take these beautiful graphic novels and I highly recommend them to Elric fans uh, then also a uh, book that I mentioned on this channel before I have um, I have already read it and uh, I'm going to be rereading it in December, the finished copy in December. It's All That Heaven Allows uh, by Mark Griffin. It's a, a biography of the Hollywood movie star Rock Hudson, who will be before the time of quite a few of you, and whose life was amazing. He was, uh, I think, completely talentless. But and, and quite a few of his co-stars also thought that he was completely talentless. Uh, but he, has, he had a kind of a classic, bland American beauty about him, a, the, the, a, a sort of a, a classic textbook masculine beauty uh, that made him eminently castable, and he became a known item at the box office. Fans would go to a movie of his. That gave him a bit of clout in Hollywood, and he used it, as so many deeply closeted gay men did at the time, to prey on other deeply closeted gay men. You would think that you would have solidarity, but no, no, you don't then any more than you do today. Uh, uh, gossipers used to say, the, the, the acidic quip used to be, that when Rock Hudson threw a party at his big, at his big house in the Hollywood Hills, uh, after a certain point, after midnight or one o'clock, the only people who would be left would be out-of-work actors <laughs> who are younger than 25. All hoping for a big break is what I guess we could euphemistically call it. Uh, and they got them. He was often true to his word. In exchange for his predation, he would he would get, you know, some anonymous android himbo from uh, from Oshkosh as a, a, a two lines in a B-list movie, which doesn't sound like much, but if you come to Hollywood with nothing and you all you have are dreams, you want that, and you're willing, a lot of people, a lot of young men, in Rock Hudson's case, willing to do just about anything to get it. Um, and this, this uh, biography doesn't pull any punches about any of that, and yet manages to be both affectionate and uh, even-keeled. So I, I thought it was tremendously impressive. And I can't wait. I read the advanced copy. I can't wait to read the finished copy. I will gladly read it again. Uh, and then let's see here. What do we have next? Oh, yes. Victory City. We saw the advanced copy on this channel by Victor Strawbaugh. It's a... Uh, uh, I've I read it, and I want to reread the finished copy. It's a rousing, two-fisted account of New York during World War II. Uh, and boy, oh, boy. I was expecting it to be just rah-rah, just, you know, flags on, on the Macy's Day Parade and whatnot. But it digs into the psychology of of everything it, it's it's um uh, really is amazing it really is amazing you're because you've got the the greatest war that anyone alive in the world had ever known taking place involving lots of people that you know lots of your fellow americans more and more every year and you are living in the middle of what already even in the 1940s anyone could see was the most powerful city that had up until that point existed anywhere in human history and that was not at war. <laughs> its people were being shipped off somewhere else, but it was not at war. And those, those, the conflicts involved in all of that are brought beautifully to life in this book. Just amazing. I can't wait to read it again. It was a thrilling reading experience, much like All That Heaven, was, All that heaven Allows. It was a thrilling reading experience. The type of thing where I, when I, read, I read finished copies, I reread books for professional reasons because I get the advanced copy, I read it quickly, because I value first impressions, you know, I value, okay, what, what is sticking out? What did I really like? What made me smile? What made me miss a subway stop? I value stuff like that. That's important. Uh, but, uh, that's, you know, that's where a lot of people that I know, that's where their reading stops is just that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is, that is the, the, uh, experience of being passionately, personally involved in what you read. And I am. The only thing is, I need to go at it a second time and sometimes a third time because I also have to be critically responsible for it, which is not a thing that a lot of readers, you know, I know I know quite a few readers who consider that to be spoiling the experience. And maybe it would for them, but it certainly doesn't for me. I love it. And uh, I read both of these books 
just basically as a normal reader that first time through in their advanced copies. And I can't wait to sit down, pencil in hand, with their finished copies and engage with them, grapple with them on every level, especially since they're works of history and biography, so that I can actually grapple with them on their own grounds of research. Uh, I can't wait. Uh, I, also, I almost always end up enjoying the book more the second time anyway, so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm all for it. Uh, but I've started digressing. Where, where did that leave us? Uh, oh, yes, there's a kid's book. <laughs> there's a kid's book that's coming out. I don't have it here. It's buried out in the other rooms. Uh, it's called I'll Love You to the Cows Come Home. Uh, and it's by, it's written by Ka uh, uh, Catherine Cristaldi, and it's drawn uh, by Kristen Litton. And it's a kid's book about loving you until the cows come home, which is an old phrase. You know, I knew it from, from Ireland where you, the cows go out all day and then late, late in the day or late, late in the season, they come back uh, to, to the home meadow, to the home paddock. <laughs> and uh, this, I, you're going to have to explain that to kids first because most of the kids who read this book will never have seen a cow. Uh, or most of the books that have this book read to them will never have seen a cow, they, except on videos on YouTube. Most of them, <clears throat> most of the young children that I know right now uh I know four of them that are under two. I know probably ten of them that are under ten. And none of them has ever even touched a cow. So, so <laughs> much less, by the time I was that age, I'd milked the cow and walked with them, and taken them places, learned their personalities. But most, most of the children I know, their experience of animals of any kind, except for the cat in the, in the house, is visual. It's video. It's not, it's not direct. Uh, and so you're going to have to explain till the cows come home to them first when you read this, but it's, it's tremendously fun to read out loud. I have given it a, uh, a trial run out loud and it works really well. Uh, and then we'll move on from, Oh, okay. Next. Okay. Now we have, uh, some visual aids to wrap this up before it gets too long. Uh, so the next two are romances and we've seen both of them on this channel before. Uh, but I'll be reading them now, now that December has finally arrived. The first one is, uh, the Duke I once knew by Olivia Drake. And it's about a, a young woman who has spent years taking care of everyone but herself. She is, she is the old reliable in her family. She is the one to chaperone the children. She is the one to help the older people. She is the one to always be there when anybody needs to talk or an errand run or stability of some kind or other. And finally, she decides that she would like to have a little bit of a life of her own. And she decides to, to be a governess to, to work, to go and work at a neighboring estate. And she's a little leery of that because the estate is owned by a man who once upon a time trifled with her affections. And uh, at first she's worried that she'll meet him again and it could only be awkward. Uh, that sure looks awkward, doesn't it? <laughs> but then she realizes that he, what's his, he, he is uh, uh, Maxwell Bryce, the Duke of Rothwell. And she realizes that he's been gone from his, his estate for a long time. So she probably doesn't have to. The odds are probably good. She probably doesn't have to worry about it. And any of you who have read romance novels will know what happens. <laughs> he shows up. <laughs> and not only does he show up, but he's pretty sure that she's the one who wronged him. And uh, uh, that is the, uh, the premise. And that is also like, I read the first 20 or 25 pages and was totally taken. So I'll be, I'll be finishing this. Uh, in December. <laughs> and then the other romance, another thing we saw on this channel, because I got it very kindly from the publicist. This is by Jana McGregor, and it is The Good, The Bad, and The Duke. Uh, this is The Cavendish Heiresses. This is, uh, let's, uh, let, let, The Cavendish Heiresses. Let's see. I haven't read this one at all. I haven't read anything about it. Let's see. Lady Daphne Hallworth is ready to celebrate the holidays with her family. But when they accidentally leave her home alone, Daphne uses the time to work on her dream, opening a home for unwed mothers. But her quest isn't problem-free. She's in a battle to win the property for the home against her brother's best friend-turned-enemy, Paul Barstow, the Duke of Southwark. Uh, and that's not all. Someone has stolen her personal diary, which holds secrets that could devastate her family. Daphne has always harbored private feelings for the man her family scorns, though perhaps striking a bargain with the handsome Duke will solve both their problems. <laughs> I'm figuring. I'm hoping that it will solve problems they didn't even know they had. <laughs> so, so these are two, these are two 
uh, Regency romances, and I got them both from the publicist uh, in trade paperback format, but they will be coming out as mass markets in December, uh, and I'm, I'm all on board <laughs> for Regencies in December, especially since it sounds like uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Duke is also going to be a Christmas Regency, which have an extra layer of sentimentality for, <laughs> for somebody like me. Uh, and then uh, next is another book we've seen on this channel. It's historical fiction. It's this, The Enemy of My Enemy. This is a clandestine operations novel. Uh, conceived and maybe partially plotted by W.E.B. Griffin, but mostly written by William Butterworth. Uh, and these are great. The clandestine operation novels are fantastic. There have been about half a dozen of them. Uh, and this is a, one of those instances where... How many have there been here? Yes, okay, this is the fifth one. So not many. Uh, and this is one of those rare instances where I love this series so much, and it is so good and so adaptable. Every book you can jump in on their own, but this is one of the rare instances where I'm saying, if you've got, you know, an extra thirty dollars, uh, go to your Barnes and Noble and find the first three of these in the, those the, those taller paperbacks of what they're they're issued in, and just buy them. You're gonna love them. <laughs> You're absolutely gonna love them. They're historical, as you can see from the the uh, the Nazi armband there. You, they're historical. They take place in and around World War II. This one takes place a little bit after, immediately after World War II, uh, and the ramp up to a whole different kind of war. <laughs> uh, but the the setting is done well, yes. But the main thing is that the characters jump off the page, and boy, oh boy, can William Butterworth write action sequences. They're amazing. They're amazingly good. As in terms of of uh, historical thriller type stuff, if you've got that itch to scratch, you won't find any better than this series. So. Uh, it's, it's a rare instance where I've got this new book in front of me. This is probably sinfully expensive. This is, yes, yeah, thirty dollars. Uh, but the paperbacks won't be, and the paperbacks will because it's W. E. B. Griffin on the ti on the head, of, you know, in the big type on the cover. Their paperbacks will be in your bookstore, and they're well worth your time. If you like this kind of stuff, you won't find it done any better. Uh, and I, I this I got this this uh, the finished copy of this latest one, and I haven't got to it, uh, but I am going to. I am going to cover all of December in December. I am going to finish out clean, <laughs> no matter how much reading time I have to devote to it. I have a little more reading time these days, and I intend to devote it all to catching up and then getting ahead. Uh, so, the, And I'm working on getting ahead. So this might be uh, the last TBR that is not a TBRBY. I just dread the idea that some month in 2019 is going to be what October was in this month. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't happen. And then uh, the last one, uh, last thing I'll do for this TBR, uh, I guess technically I have not read it, but it's going to feel like coming home. And I cannot believe that this is being made. Just cannot believe it. Uh, it's the folks at MIT Press, and God bless them. God bless the academic presses. I don't know of any other press that would try this. Uh, and, uh, well, this is amazing. I, if you don't, you won't, you, most of you won't know this author, and you won't know what I'm talking about. But I'm telling you, this is an event. Uh, this is, it, it's a book called Fascination. And it is a collection of three memoirs by an author named Kevin Killian. The memoirs are Bedrooms Have Windows, Bachelors Get Lonely, and Triangles in the Sand. This is what the trade paperback looks like. The memoirs were never very big, so they're, uh, they're incredibly aphoristic, but they're not very long. So you can actually put all of Kevin Killian's uh, extremely spirited renditions of his own life and experiences in one handy volume. Only I can't believe anyone ever would. I'm so happy that the people at MIT Press did. So let me read you uh, a little about this. Um, uh, Fascination is a memoir of gay life in 1970s Long Island by one of the leading proponents of the new narrative movement. Uh, Kevin Killian, uh, Fascination brings together an early memoir, Bedrooms Have Windows, from 1989, when everything in the world made sense. Uh, and a previously unpublished prose work, Bachelors Get Lonely, by the poet and novelist Kevin Killian, one of the founding members of the New Narrative Movement. Uh, the two together depict the author's early years struggling to become a writer in the sexed-up, boozy, drug-ridden world of Long Island's North Shore in the 1970s. It concludes with Triangles in the Sand, a new and previously unpublished memoir of Killian's brief affair in the 1970s with the composer Arthur Russell. Fascination offers a moving and often funny view of the loneliness and desire that defined gay life of that era. Uh, a time in which Richard Nixon's resignation intersected with David Bowie's Diamond Dogs. From one of the leading voices in experimental gay writing of the past 30 years. Uh, Move along the velvet rope, Killian writes in Bedrooms Have Windows. 
Run your shaky fingers past the lacquered Keith Haring graffito. You did not live in our time. Be sorry. <laughs> uh, and so this is uh, the, the first thing, the first thing repeat, reprinted in this book is a book that some of us know well. And then there's new material. So this is amazing. It's an um, this is an amazing thing. It won't. It's 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 low key. It comes out in mid no, in mid December. It's low key and it's fairly niche. So I don't know what kind of play it's gonna get, but boy oh boy, <laughs> if you are interested in the subject, uh, unfortunately, I know a lot of young people who uh, the word queer is never far from their lips. It's queer this, queer that. They have you know, shaved sides to their head, they have multicolored hair, they're in your face ready to call you a bigot if you even ask them the price of groceries, because what does the price of groceries have to do with me being a downtrodden minority? They can't stop talking about it, and yet they neither know anything about gay history in America, nor care anything about it. So I don't know, I never know what to do, I just maintain a completely diplomatic silence, which you'll notice I don't do on this channel. <laughs> Uh, but if I, if I'm confronted with with one of those you know aquamarine haired nineteen year olds wanting to lecture me about about queer this and queer that, I want to know: Do you know anything about this world? Did you did you live in it? Did you do you have any idea what it was like when you could be hunted for sport in this country? When when there were no laws? When there was no public recognition? When there was no RuPaul's Drag Race? Do, do you have any idea? What you're talking about, the answer is universally no, and this is what they're missing. So if, if the subject interests you, if, if you are, for instance, gay, and you're in the least bit interested in the most eloquent and interesting and provocative voices from your own past, your own history, you should find this book from MIT Press. It might be the only book... If, uh, you should find this book from MIT Press. The fact that they're making it deeply surprises me and endlessly pleases me. These things deserve a second shot at life. Uh, and uh, also it gives me Kevin Killian to read that I've never read before, which is an absolute thrill. So, so, so. so that is going to, uh, to end this December 2018 TBR, which is mostly a TBR. Most of the stuff on here, I can't lecture you about because I haven't read it yet. So we'll do a Steve file. And I, this is just a sign, but this is, don't, don't get used to this because I'm going to be reading. Once I rock it past my backlog of December, then, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, I'm going to finish out December and then probably hit the ground running in January. We shall see. Uh, so first we have The Enemy of My Enemy uh, by William Butterworth and W.B. Griffin. Uh, then we have uh, Fascination, a collection of three memoirs by Kevin Killian. Uh, then, let's see here, uh, Romances, we have The Good, The Bad, and The Duke, uh, Christmas Regency Romance, and The Duke I Once Knew, about uh, old frenemies getting back together and seeing whether or not sparks fly, and since it's a romance novel, they probably will. <laughs> and then and then a bunch of others that I don't have with me that I'm not going to that I'm not gonna stack. So it was uh, uh, Victory City uh, by John Strombaugh, which I, I highly recommend, uh, the look of. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I, I, I haven't gone over it a second time, but the, my, my first reading of it, I really liked. Uh, then, uh, I'll love you to the cows come home. When you find it in your kids section, just look through it and see. I think you'll find that it's a winner. Uh, then, uh, there's a graphic novel adaptation of the Elric of Melnibone novels of Michael Moorcock, and it's ongoing. So if you, if you look at the second one, if it happens to be in your comic shop or your bookstore and you like the look of it, there's another one where, that you can get. At least one. I'm pretty sure there was only one before this. Uh, then All That Heaven Allows, a big, juicy new biography of Rock Hudson, probably definitive. Uh, then uh, the Dan Slott, Mike Alred, Silver Surfer run is all coming out in one big volume. Uh, for you comic book fans, uh, I know that in the ranks of, uh, of Comics Gate, Dan Slott is a supervillain. He is Slotto Blocktavius. He is, he is hated by them. And quite a few people in, uh, in comics critics, whether they're comic skater or otherwise, have gone panel by panel, idea by idea in Dan Slott's Silver Surfer and found a lot of icky stuff. And I confess, until I saw those videos, I did never cross my mind, and it won't cross yours either. It, 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 the story's on their own. If you don't know anything about the author, if you haven't stalked him on Twitter, the stories on their own are quite wonderful, I think. Uh, and then, let's see here, uh, In the House of Lies, the new Ian Rankin 
a new Rebus novel. I don't anticipate that it will disappoint me. Uh, uh, and uh, Queen of Air and Darkness by Cassandra Clare, uh, the, the new Dark Artifices novel that, it, that <laughs> I, might, I might take a stern tone with, uh, with YA on this channel, but it, when it's done right, I am, in my mind, in spirit anyway, I am in the line for the Midnight Debut. I'm not going to do that because it requires pants. But I, I, when, when it's done right and the hype is warranted, then I'm right there alongside all of my tween brethren. <laughs> so, so that is kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a raggedy uh, December TBR uh, for 2018. But I wanted to get something done because I'm seeing all those videos and I love them. So I love to I love to join the conversation. Uh, but I'll wrap this up and uh, we'll be back to talk about more bookish stuff in time. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.